You know, it's a sad fact that the ones who were voted most likely to succeed often didn't. Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. As the Bible bus continues its journey through the Old Testament book of Judges, we meet the prophet Gideon, who was probably voted most likely to succeed, but his life didn't end that way. We'll begin in Judges chapter 8, so turn there in your Bible if you can. And we've got a couple of minutes before our study begins, and Dr. McGee took this extra time to share something about the ministry of Through the Bible, specifically how God provides financially in taking the whole word to the whole world. Here's Dr. McGee. It has never been our plan or purpose from the very beginning to use high-pressure methods. We do not send out junk mail. Everyone that's on our mailing list got there because they asked to be put there or else someone asked for them. We today believe that if you are not able to support the program and you want our notes and outlines that God will raise up somebody down the street or over in the next town to send in enough for you and for them also. We believe that the real test is the support that comes from any area, and we will not continue on a program if we do not get a reasonable amount of support. And we always give every station a fair opportunity to see if it's going to pay for itself. And that, by the way, is all that we ask. We do from time to time appeal to you to support our foreign broadcasts. After all, we cannot ask them, uh, that is, the Chinese or the people of India or the people of South America or the people in Russia to support our program. We believe that there are enough folk in this country that are interested in getting out the word over iron curtains, under bamboo curtains, and through the curtains of indifference and sin today uh, to get the Word of God out to the world. So we just let you know this and trust you'll understand that we do need your support, though we will not violate our rule by using high-pressure methods. Well, since Dr. McGee first recorded that, God himself has brought down the Iron Curtain, and we now broadcast into Russia, and then he's lifted the bamboo curtain in other communist countries, and we often pray on the World Prayer Team for spiritual fruit in places like China, Cambodia, and Laos. You know, I'm sure that Dr. McGee would be amazed at how the world has changed and continues to change as we pray. Now, other spiritual barrier walls are coming down as well especially in the digital broadcasting world throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And a people who were once far off are now being brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. We attribute through the Bible's place in this amazing season as God's blessing the mission of taking the whole word to the whole world. We hope that you can see that. Along with that, we believe that God blesses those who stand in partnership with us in this mission. We believe that your prayer support alone, without the financial support, has done more for this daily program than we can know this side of heaven. And we're convinced that it's true. We also know that God loves the cheerful giver for this ministry. You know, we read about it almost every day in your letters. You know, it's a joy to be all in, praying for and financially supporting what God's doing. And you know, y'all say it in such a fun way and that you're putting gas in the Bible bus or maybe you're paying for an oil change or a new set of tires. But really, this is very serious and a very joyful opportunity that you're embracing. Together, we're taking God's whole word to the whole world. And there couldn't be anything better than that. And we're so very grateful for your partnership with us. Now let's pray as we get into today's study of Judges chapter 8. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to hear from you. Would you give us eyes of faith and generous hearts as we see your work in us and in others around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come to the eighth chapter of the book of Judges today, and you will notice that we have more concerning Gideon than any other judge. This man, Gideon, we began with him 
actually in chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. And then, of course, in chapter 9, we have the story of his son. There's a question whether he was a judge or not. But we have this rather extended section here, and we'll be, of course, taking that up now. Here in the eighth chapter, you find that these are the events that came to pass after this remarkable deliverance that God gave through Gideon over the Midianites. And now the children of Israel again are free, and as a result, why they are prosperous, they are being blessed, and they were so grateful to Gideon for what he had done that they then ask him, and I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 22 of chapter 8, of judges, and I'm reading. Then the man of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now, this is the very first time that we've been given the inclination of the people of Israel in wanting a king to rule over them. God told them at the beginning he did not want them to have a king like the nations round about them, but they began to want a king like the nations round about them. And because Gideon had delivered them, they asked him now to accept that position. Now, he's the first one that apparently it's been offered to, and he turned it down. And later on, we'll find out that they'll ask for a king again, and they become insistent upon it. They demand a king. And God tells Samuel that he's to anoint a king for them. And he says to Samuel, who is actually the last of the judges, the first of the prophets, that is, of the order of prophets. And God told Samuel, he said, they have not rejected you, they've rejected me. You see, God wanted to rule over them. And in this case, why it was God that had used Gideon so remarkably, but now the men of Israel, they want Gideon to rule over them. And not only Gideon, but his son and his son's sons, which means they want a king like the other nations that are round about them. And this, of course, gave an idea, it put a thought in the mind of Gideon's son that we'll see in just a few moments and probably was the very basis of his conspiracy and his attempt to become, actually, the king over these people. Now, I want you to notice the remarkable answer that Gideon gave. And this is remarkable, verse 23. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now, this man Gideon has certainly learned the lesson. There's no question about that. He recognized this boy that was there. He was thrashing grain down by the wine press, the coward that he was. And Gideon knew that God had given the victory and that it was not in him, but God had raised him up for this purpose and that the order was a theocracy, that is, that God wanted to rule directly over these people. And so he says, I'm not going to rule over you, and my son will not rule over you, and the Lord is the one that shall rule over you. Now, Gideon is therefore a very remarkable person. And you'll find that when in the chapter in Hebrews of the, we call them heroes of faith, but it's what faith did in the lives of man in the past, under all ages and conditions. And we find here in verse 32 of Hebrews 11, And what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon? And he leads the list here of all the judges. In fact, the matter is he's put in the head of the list of David. Of course, he comes chronologically before David. I've always marveled that David was given such a small a space in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, but the explanation is that the writer says, the time would fail me, and he wanted to tell about Gideon. Well, the story is recorded 
back here, and it's a remarkable story. This man, Gideon, raised up. God chooses the weak things of the world, and that's his method today, friends. Any man, a woman that God uses has to be used on God's terms, and this is his terms. He chooses the weak things of this world. Now, as I said at the beginning, most of us are too strong for God to use us and to lead us. Now, I wish we could close the record of Gideon at this particular spot, but you can't. And this is the black mark in his life. This is actually the basis of that which caused tragedy later on. All of these men had a glaring weakness, and most of the cases, God used that. And, of course, the weakness of this man, Gideon, was the fact that he was a coward, very frankly. I felt very close to this man, Gideon, myself and my ministry. When I went to become pastor in 1949 at the Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles, My first message to the people was on Gideon. And I put myself in that class that I came in weakness and that the only reason I could see that God had called me was the fact that I was like Gideon. In that respect, I sure was weak and cowardly, by the way. And I have rejoiced in the fact that God did for me what he did for Gideon. He certainly was with me, and I've always been grateful to him. And I've discovered that when I get in the way and I do some time, why, then I stumble and fall. But as long as you're just willing to let God do it, it's remarkable what he'll do. And I give God all the glory for this radio ministry, friends. I never sought it. I I didn't start out after it. It just like Topsy, it growed and God has blessed it, and I rejoice in it. He's been very wonderful. What a testimony. I wish we could end here, but Gideon had another weakness. And here it is, verse 30. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. He had 70 sons, friends, and he had many wives. Now, That's the blot on this man's life, and it's a real blot, because somebody's going to come along, as they say about Solomon. Oh, how could God use a man like this, and why would God take a man like this? Now, God didn't take Gideon, as we've seen, because of this. He did this afterward, and the fact of the matter is that God used him in spite of this. And God did not approve of this. The record has it here. And I think the record makes it clear that this brought tragedy into the nation, as we'll see here in the next chapter. And so this is a blot in the life of Gideon. God had forbidden them, forbidden them to intermarry outside. He had forbidden them to have more than one wife. And God didn't create a bunch of Eves for Adam. He only created one. He didn't take out all his ribs. He only took out one. Fact of the matter is, God has never blessed that, beginning with Abraham. Abraham, you know, had another wife. That is, he took a concubine, that little Egyptian maid, Hagar, and believe me, it caused trouble. Friends, it's still causing trouble. I talked to an Arab guy down at Jericho that took me down there, and he was very proud of the fact. He says, I'm a son of Abraham. He's an Arab. And you know how? Through Ishmael. He was a Muslim, and he was very proud. He said, I'm a son of Abraham through Ishmael. That's true. That was the sin of Abraham. God never blessed that, friends. And God is not going to bless Gideon. And God didn't bless this man Solomon. In fact, the matter is it split the kingdom, and it's going to cause tragedy here. This is the blot in his life. Just because the record is given, God doesn't hide anything. God paints man's picture as he is. Now, if a friend who is his biographer had written this, he'd left this out, I'm sure, but not God. He paints mankind in all of his lurid, sinful colors. And this man, 
Gideon. This is the black mark against him. And we have here that he had a concubine that was in Shechem. She also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Keep him before you, by the way. He actually had 71 sons. Now, verse 33, it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again, and they went a-whoring after Balaam, and made Baal bereath their God. Same old story, is it not? The hoop of history continues to roll as it's rolling today. You find them a nation serving God. Then what happens? They did evil. They forsook God. They turned to Baal. And God sells them into slavery and servitude. They cry out to God. They repented and judges raised up and delivered them and the nation serving God. But here they go again. That soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel turned again when a whoring after Balaam. That is the sad, sordid story of that nation and also actually of his church today. And it's true, I'm afraid, in the lives of nations, it's in the lives of churches, it's in the lives of individuals, this up and down business. Today, many of us are just rolling a hook through this world. One day we're up, the next day we're down. God never intended our spiritual life to be like that, by the way. Now we come to chapter 9, and I'm not going to have too much to say about chapter 9 because we have the story of Abimelech, the sinful and wicked son of Gideon. You see, he shouldn't have had this concubine. I tell you, it caused trouble in the nation. And what kind of trouble did it occur? Well, this boy Abimelech is very ambitious. He's going to do an awful thing. And he's rated by some a judge and by others, he's not rated a judge. And you'll note that in my outline that I've given, more or less, I guess you'd say I've taken a middle course, because in this fifth apostasy, there was civil war, and it was caused largely by Abimelech. And actually, this man Abimelech, along with Tola and Jair, they were the judges during this period. I don't think any of them did very much, but they are recorded as being the one during this time of internal trouble that was actually caused by Abimelech and the awful thing that he did. Now, we're told here that Gideon had 70 sons. And what did this boy Abimelech do? Well, we find here that the men of Shechem, because his mother was from that land, they followed this boy Abimelech. And he had heard the nation wanting Gideon to become their ruler and his son. And so this boy wanted to become a king. He's very ambitious. And the thing that he did, and I'm not reading all of this chapter. I trust you will. You'll find it very candidly, very profitable, because here's a lesson. This reveals the sin of man. And you find here that this man, Abimelech, is a very wicked person. And Dr. Gray wrote this concerning him. He says, The usurp rule of Abimelech, the fratricide, is not usually counted. That is, he's not counted as a judge. He did rule three years. And what was it he did? He slew the 70 sons of Gideon, and he made himself king. And his abortive reign reveals, I think, the truth of Daniel 4, 17. The most High ruleth in the kingdom of man, and he setteth up over it the basis of man. Now, when a good ruler comes along in the world, a great man, people say, well, God raised him up. What about that wicked ruler? Well, God permits him to come to the throne. You know why? Because like priests, like people is the principle here. And we find that these people, they got the kind of ruler they deserve. And they wanted this boy Abimelech to rule over him, and he ruled over them. And God sets over this world the basis of rulers. All you've got to do, friends, look around in the world today. You'll find that's the way that it is. Now, we find here that God judges this man Abimelech for the awful thing that he did. And he also judges the man of Shechem for making him king. 
and starting him out at this. And there was civil war because there were many didn't want him, of course. And I'll begin reading now at verse 52. And Abimelech came under the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me a woman slew him. <laughs> he didn't want that reputation. And his young man thrust him through and he died. And when the man of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his seventy brethren. And all the evil of the man of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. Now, this is the sad story and the sad ending, actually, of this man Gideon. After being such a remarkable ruler and lifted up out from nothing, then to have this in his life, that God could not approve of, did not approve of, and finally had to judge. Now that actually brings us down to chapter 10. And you have given here now the judge that we put along with Abimelech. We have put in our outline, I'm sure that you've noticed that, that we had in this fifth apostasy in the civil war that was caused by Abimelech, and yet he apparently for two or three years delivered the people and brought a certain amount of peace to the land. But, of course, the civil war broke out, and he's put here with Tola and Jair. Now, we come in chapter 10 first to this man, Tola. Maybe you've never heard of Tola, and if you haven't, it's perfectly all right. He never did anything. Notice this. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years. And what did he do? He died. He was buried in Shamir. Not one thing is recorded about what this man did. Friends, I want to say to you that this man was pretty much of a failure. Just think of it. There's not one thing that you can mention that this man did from the day he was born to the day he died. All you've got here is what's on his tombstone. Born, died. And I guess you could say he was judged. Well, this man Jair that we're coming to now, Jair, he's the eighth judge. Now let me read. After him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. Now, what did he do? Well, he had 30 sons. They rode on 30 ass coats, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair, unto this day, which in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Cayman. All that we're told about this man is that he had 30 sons, and he bought each one of them a little donkey. And, of course, that was the same as buying them a convertible in that day. And he didn't get him a Jaguar or a Mustang or a Pinto or a Cougar. And he didn't put a tiger in the tank either. But he gave each one of them a donkey. And I think the funniest sight, well, it was a show to see those 30 boys go riding out of Gilead every morning. What a sight this was. And so we're going to look at that next time and move on to Jephthah, the ninth judge. Jephthah. Another man that had a uh, mark against him, but God used him. May God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, all those donkeys must have been a funny sight. We'll get to that next time. If you want to get your heart ready and your mind, let's read ahead through Judges chapter 10. And if the Lord has used this program to bless you and grow your understanding of His Word, and you'd like to financially support what He's doing around the world, then visit ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can also email BibleBus at ttb.org or send your gift to Box 7100, 
Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And remember, hop aboard the Bible bus next time as our adventure in the book of Judges continues. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be right here saving you a seat. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?